Welcome to Imagine Wealth Without Risk, the podcast that guides you to fulfilling your dreams through guaranteed, secure investing. Here's your host, Ted Thomas. Hi, everyone. This is Ted Thomas. And the title for this podcast is Imagine Wealth Without Risk. And boy, am I going to talk about that today. So this podcast is all about tax lien certificates and about tax defaulted property, which you know as tax deeds. Now, I'll have a guest later on, a very famous guest, as a matter of fact. His name is Alex Mondosian. And wow, is he not only an entertainer, but this guy's really done well on the Internet and done well his whole life. Alex and I met way back uh, more than 20 years ago. I was making infomercial, and he was too. He was involved with a big advertising agency on Madison Avenue in New York City, and they were making an infomercial with Susan Summers, and I'll never forget that. It was called the Thigh Master. So if you're old enough, you might remember that, but if you're a young person, I get that too. Remember, if you have questions, you can always email your question to info at tedthomas.com. So let me say that again. Anytime you have a question, just let me know. I, I get a lot of questions, but I forget to remind everyone. So anytime you want, just go info at tedthomas.com, and uh, I'll get back with you either on the podcast or directly uh, with uh, the answers to your question. Okay. So the whole approach here that I'm really teaching people is this is just let's learn how to be capitalists, and let's help people on the way. Okay. So uh, I like to teach people how to make money with these government certificates, but I'm really a capitalist and I want you to be one too. And I want you to make a lot of money and you do what you want with that, but you're going to get to a point just like I am now and I'm going to have to give it all away. And what's wrong with that? You can give it all away and you can give it to who you want it to and not who the government wants it to. So I'm not negative on the government, but I want to give my money to who I want to give it to. So let's teach you to be a capitalist, okay? So Georgia has been very much on my mind over the past week or so. I think that was about 25 years ago. There was a, a famous guy with a real gravelly voice. His name was Ray Charles, and he made a, a song about Georgia on my mind. But I think they were thinking about romance. I've been thinking about money. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about making money in Georgia because it's a great place to make money. And I've had podcasts with people, and I'll have future podcasts about different people that have made money in Georgia. For example, my associate and coach, Mr. Bob Schumacher, lives in Georgia, and he started with me more than 15 years ago. And there isn't anybody that's listening to me right now that wouldn't like to have all the money he has in his IRA for making money in Georgia. But I'm going to start out telling you about Jeff Dubay. Now, Jeff Dubay is one of my students, and we'll have him on as a guest also. But he's made a ton of money, and he's made it quickly. And he's doing that just by following along with some very simple rules. Now, Jeff has been through our training programs. He's been to a three-day event. But he did what a lot of people won't do. He's assertive. He's not just smart, but he's assertive. He's assertive in the sense that he's going to put things to work. In other words, he's going to take action and see what he can do about making money. And so he learned about Georgia. Now, Jeff does not live in Georgia. He, as a matter of fact, he lives in Florida. And so he wanted to, to make money, and he wants to make it in large lumps of money. And he has made other money, and he's a guy that he's done some fixer-uppers, and he's done some rental, and he has another business involving recreational vehicles. And so he does well, and he wants to put his earnings to work. When he heard about Georgia, he said, look, I'm not afraid to get my hands dirty. I want to get into this and go make some money. And at the workshop, he met Coach Bob Schumacher. So using Bob as his guide and coach, this guy really took some action. Now, when I say he took some action, he got involved. So first he got involved in Florida, and then simultaneously he decided he had to start looking at Georgia at the same time. Now, let me tell you a little bit about Bob, and then I'll tell you a little bit about Jeff Dubé. So Bob is a big-time traveler. And when I say he's a traveler, he travels for work. He's a forester. So Companies will have him go into their forest, and that could be in Florida, it could be in Oregon, it could be in Washington State, or it could be internationally, like uh, Vancouver Island in Canada. And he goes and uh, he measures the trees and uh, maps out where their land is and tells them when they should harvest the trees because they want to harvest it and sell the wood, and then they want to regrow it and so on. He spent a lot of time traveling, and he travels alone and 
he's used to the woods and used to living with the bears and the animals and all the rest of things. And he does all that by his truck. And I jokingly at the event tell everybody he's a cheapskate because the last truck he had about 300,000 miles on it. And I said, my goodness, can't you trade in so someone in the automobile business can make another one and make some money? And no, he wants to keep them. But we finally shamed him into buying a new truck. And at the last event, I said, Bob, how's that new truck doing? His new truck is now up to 350,000 miles. So Bob makes some trips, that's for sure. So between trips, he's buying at auctions. And he buys a lot at auctions. He's done over 150,000, 150 deals, and he's made himself thousands and thousands of dollars. So when Jeff Dubois found out about him, he said, I'm going to glam onto him and get real close. And so they formed a, a, a friendship. And next thing I'm hearing from Jeff, and he's over in Georgia getting involved in the deals in Georgia. So let me tell you a little bit about Georgia, and then I'm going to tell you about how Jeff's making money quickly right now. In Georgia, they don't sell a tax lien. They sell what's called a tax deed, but the tax deed is redeemable. Now, that's a little confusing, so let me clean it up. So the local county sells the deed to the property. So when you raise your hand at the auction, you're actually buying the deed to that property. However, the homeowner or property owner, anytime they want, can come back and say, I want my property back. And when they want their property back, they're going to redeem it. So it's a redeemable deed. And you say to yourself, why do I want to buy a property that they're going to come back and redeem? And here's why. In Georgia, when that county sells you that deed, that redeemable deed, that st starts a time clock running. And that deed is redeemable. In the first year, anytime the homeowner redeems that tax deed which you purchased at auction, they have to give you back all your money plus 20%. Whoa, think about what I just said. So that means if next month you bought today and the next month they come in and redeem, you're going to get all your money back 20%. Well, 20% return, uh, I don't know about you, but that's a real good return when you know you're guaranteed to get your money back because if you don't get your money back, you're going to get the property. So is that a pretty good rate of return? I think it's an excellent one. Now, to add to that and make it even better, in Georgia, they do auctions every month. So that means the state, which has round numbers, 159 counties, is going to have 159 auctions. So you could buy one this month and get paid off next month and maybe even go to another auction next month. So your money's only out maybe 30 days or whatever the days are. And you can be ready to place it again in the, in the subsequent month. So my point is, you could be going to auctions and buying properties right now and getting paid off in a very short period of time. So Jeff learned that. And he learned it in detail from Bob. And within the first nine months, he purchased nine properties. It might have been eight, but I think it was nine properties, okay? Now, when he purchased those properties... Keep in mind, he bought a redeemable deed. So anytime that homeowner comes in and, and pays him, he gets all his money back plus 20%. Now, if he's a good buyer, he's probably only paying 10 or 20, maybe even 30 cents on the dollar for the property. So either way, he's going to be a happy camper. All right, now let me add another plus, and then I'll go back and I'll review all this. Another plus is this. When you buy that redeemable deed, any time in the first year, that 365 days, any time they have to pay you 20%. Now, if they don't pay you, at the end of the year, you could start a foreclosure. If you're my student, I don't want you to foreclose. Just let it roll into the next year. Because in the next year, day 366, now they owe you whatever you paid plus 30%. Now you make 30% in the second year. Now, I'm never going to get through all of Georgia in a few minutes because there's a lot to discuss here. But let's think this out. First of all, it's a redeemable deed. Second of all, there could be as many as 160 auctions a month. Thirdly, all of the auctions are physical. In other words, the auctions that you go to the courthouse steps. So you'd want to go there to see this happen. All right. So now... 
You can buy properties. If they redeem, you're going to get 20% immediately. If you don't, if you buy them at the end of the first year, you could start a foreclosure. Not a bad deal, okay? I think this is a terrific deal. And anybody that misses out on that is really missing something big. Now, later in another podcast, I'll talk about Texas because it'll be a similar situation. And so we need to learn about these states. Now, I've mentioned in other podcasts a little bit about penalties. But let's go back and talk about Jeff. He's already purchased eight or nine of these properties. So in his first year, he's invested $200,000. Now think about that. So his worst case at the end of the year, his worst case on a $200,000 investment is to make $40,000. Now, I want you to think that out thoroughly because how much risk has he taken? I love to get out of the risk business. So his risk was this. He invested $200,000. If he gets gets paid off, he makes $40,000. If he doesn't get paid off, he's going to have a whole bunch of properties for 20 or 30 cents on the dollar. Now, he's not paid on those until he sells them after that first year. My point is, is this a great investment environment? Now, have I learned and have you t- have I taught you and have you learned every trick of doing business in Georgia? No, but there's a coach to help you with all the details. But I'm trying to convey to you that there's a heck of a deal in just this one state. Now, we're going to be able to find out these kind of things about each state because they have, in many instances, they'll have something even better than Georgia. In many instances, it won't be as good, but there'll be something else that is just as good. So you're getting the idea. You don't have to be uh, doing investments at the bank, making one or 2%. You need to be learning something that's new. It's exciting. This is old. All this has been around. Georgia has been doing this since the colonies were here. So the state rules are different in Georgia. The county rules are different. So if we decide to go to New Mexico or California or we go to New York or whatever state you happen to be in, it's going to be different. But here the rules in Georgia are definitely to your benefit. All right, so there's an example of a student going to be able to make $40,000. All right, now let me give you, as I said, Georgia's on my mind. So I want to give you another unusual situation. Now, I say to others all the time, when you get involved in this, you're going to get involved in the world of the weird and that weird things happen. I don't know what's going to happen, but I have so many students, hundreds of nationwide, and I'm hearing and talking to these people every day and guiding them as my coaches are doing. All right. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about B.R. Baker. Now, B.R. Baker is a news man and um, he's an editor for for a a number of newspapers and uh, he's learned as he's gone along and uh, he learned about these tax auctions. So let me give you an example and I can't give you all the details on this podcast but I will on a subsequent broadcast go into all the details of it. But uh, BR learned about this so he started looking at the auctions in his local community. Now tax lien certificates and tax deeds can be sold not only by the county, but by municipalities. And in some places, even the school districts can do that. And school districts might have them for sale in Georgia. The same thing happened in Texas. School districts will be involved in it. There could be many different entities selling these tax auctions. So you need to get into this and get into it in depth. So I generally say, look, there's 3,000 counties doing it. There's 1,700 municipalities. But I'm, I'm here to tell you, that there's a lot of places selling these certificates. So it's going to be the land of abundance. But let me tell you what BR did, and then I'll come back and give you the details on another podcast. So he started watching the auction, and a property came up, and the auction price was only $300, and it was for a residential home. Now, let me give you the backstory in the residential home. What had happened on this residential home, it had good value. However, the people passed away. When they passed away, their heirs, their children, did not want to pay the mortgage payment. So they didn't. So the mortgage company foreclosed on the property, which means it would now be their property. But they didn't want it either. And so they said, oh, we're not going to make any payment. We're not going to do anything with it. So they didn't make the tax payment. So the property went to tax auction. 
So BR checked it out. He went to the auction and he spent a total of $326.03. Now, folks, I'm not sure you can buy a bicycle for $326. I know you could spend that on a fancy dinner in New York City, but you're getting the idea. So was everything perfect? No, he had to pay a few other fees. He had to pay some other little incidentals. He ended up owning this property for $1,803. I said $1,803. Now, I'm not recommending you go look for properties in this low end, but he told me it was a good property. I said, okay, let's find out how good it is. I said, go around the neighborhood and check out and see how much you could rent it for. So he went and checked and found out he could rent the property for $700 a month. I want you to keep in mind, he's got an $1,800 investment. He checked around, put a sign up, Next thing, a nice couple show up. He liked them. He rented it for $500, $500 a month. So his rent this year will be $6,000, and he invested $1,800. He did all that in Georgia in a matter of months. Now, I don't have the time on this podcast to give you the details, but you be assured that I'll come back, and we'll talk about Georgia again, as we'll do, and we'll talk about other states. this is Linda. Don't forget, you can listen to more episodes at tedthomaspodcast.com. You can also listen to Imagine Wealth Without Risk on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, and Spotify. Welcome to the podcast. This is Ted Thomas, and as we call this podcast, Imagine Wealth Without Risk. And we're going to learn a little bit more about that today. And today we're going to specialize in tax deeds And uh, we're very fortunate to have one of our coaches available today and able to talk about the auction, which is taking place very soon in Oklahoma. And for those of you folks that are new to this podcast, welcome. We're glad to have you. Sometimes I talk about tax lien certificates. Sometimes I talk about deeds. Sometimes we talk about both. But if you have questions, you can always go to info at tedthomas.com, info at tedthomas.com. And leave your question there, and uh, we'll send it in an email. And, of course, we'll get back to you uh, live and tell you a good answer to those questions. Okay, so um, today we're going to talk about tax deeds. Now, for those of you folks that are new to this, a tax deed simply means a property went to tax default. In other words, they didn't pay their taxes. So the county has to do something about that because they have a lot of bills to pay. they got to pay the county employees, got to pay the police, the fire. They have to take care of the libraries and the schools. So the county has a lot of responsibility and they need money to do that. So if people don't pay their tax, they do one of two things. They either issue a tax lien certificate or they confiscate the property and resell it. So my guest today is one of my coaches. Bill's been with me about 10 years. I hope I hit that pretty close. Everybody tells me, oh, Ted, it's 15 years. But anyway, Bill and I know each other for a long time. He's been a coach for a long period of time, and he's done over 75 deals. So this is the kind of guy that you want to work from, work with because he can tell you the ins and outs, the ups and downs, and what not to do and what you should do. So we're not going to get into the do's and don'ts too much today because we don't have that much time. But I thought you'd like to know a little bit about an auction. So I invited Bill at the last minute. I said, Bill, can you come and visit with me on the podcast? So, Bill, are you there by chance? I am, Ted. Oh, great, great. Now, where are you located? I am located in a suburb of the city of Detroit, Michigan. I see. Okay, good. I'm glad, and I hope your weather's decent there. Here in Florida, it's about 80 or 85, and we don't have a cloud in the sky. I guess we're living in paradise. I hope it's the same for you. Bill, you're headed off to an auction very soon. Uh, I don't need to go into the dates and all that kind of thing, but... Is this a big auction or a small auction? What kind of auction is this? Everything is in relative terms. The opening list was 1,510 properties. So wow. I think that's a pretty big auction. That is a big auction. Now, you said the opening to, to some of the properties get, uh, do people come in and pay the tax and they get redeemed or what happens there? Yes, they have the opportunity to do that. And wow. at this point in time, about 350 have been redeemed. Wow. And so well over a thousand properties on the active list. 
I see. So a thousand properties. Wow. And what county are you going to? Tulsa County, Tulsa, Oklahoma. Okay. And so there's still over 1,100, did you say, properties available? Yes. That's overwhelming, 1,100. Now, I've been to Tulsa before, but it's, I didn't think the auction was that big, but now it's, it's up to 1,100 properties, okay? Now, what kind of properties would be at this auction? There'll be houses, of course. That's yeah. probably the thing that most bidders are interested in. There would be vacant land, and uh, then there are a couple of commercial properties, not many, maybe 10 or less. I see. Now, when you talk about a commercial, would that be like a, an office building or would that be like a, a business building? What would that be? It can be anything. It can be a warehouse. It could be a hotel. It could literally be almost anything that is a commercial. And any apartment building that when units are larger is con considered a commercial building also. I see. Okay. All right, so there's a thousand to choose from, uh, more than a thousand, of course. And uh, my goodness, where do you start? First of all, you got to divide the list and you need to make, figure out number one, how much money you're taking with you. Let's say you're taking 20,000 with you and the opening bid for something is 25,000. Take that uh -huh. off your list because you can't afford it. Uh -huh. But you need to zero in on the types of properties you're most interested in, whether that's houses, vacant land. Not a lot of people will take and bid on vacant land because a lot of people are like, I don't know what to do with it. So yeah. and the same thing goes for commercial properties. Um, lots of people at the auction will not bid on those. The most right. I've seen bid on any one commercial property in the probably 70 or 80 auctions I've been to in my life would be four or five people. I see. So that's rare. Uh, a lot of times it just comes down to just two individuals. Someone that knows what to do with that, with that commercial property, you know? Correct, yes. I see, okay. Now, so you narrow it down by money. So is, is Tulsa a pretty big county? Is it many miles across and things like that? Or what is it? A small um, county? It's a tiny. It's good size. It's about average for the state of Oklahoma. I see, Okay. And any idea how many people live in Tulsa? I think it's around 600,000. Oh, so this is a big city. Wow. Oh, okay. Yeah, Tul Tulsa is one of only two really big cities in the state of Oklahoma. Okay, I see. All right, good. All right, now tell me how you're going to, the auction's going to take place. Well, first of all, where will the auction take place? Where will it be? At the convention center downtown Tulsa. I see. And it seems to me that you went to this auction last year, right? Yes, I did. All right. What, do you, what would you estimate? How many people will show up? Last year, there was about 400. Wow. I would say that this year, there's a good chance that it'll be three or three, 300 or 350, because I think the crowd will be down this year. I see. Any reason for the crowd being down? I think some of the weather issues that have happened in Oklahoma Oh, um, yeah. People Floods. will be more focused on cleaning up what they already have than trying to buy something new. I see. Okay. All right. 300 people. So when I'm, if I were at the auction, am I bidding against 300 people or what's are they all, are they all bidders? Or what's it like? At any auction I've ever been to, 50% of the people never place a bid. Really? Yes. So if there's 300 people there, There'd be 150 bidders, and there'll be a couple of people who will buy multiple properties. Oh. We might want to refer to those as some of the big players. Uh -huh. But as far as a lot of the stuff, people will buy one or two properties. And I, I typically don't see anybody really buy much over 10 properties. I see. Okay. And then I guess what you're saying is there's a lot of people just go to observe. Oh, definitely. So the, it's the entertainment for the day or something. The average person who goes to observe uh -huh. is there to say, okay, let me see it this year, and then next year I'll come back with money. I see. So they're learning how. But a lot happens in a year, and most of those observers probably won't be there this year that we're planning on coming from last year. Oh, I see. So people say they're going to do it, but they don't do it. I understand that a lot. 
Okay, mm-hmm. good. All right. Now, how will you determine a little bit more? Give me a little bit more information on how we'll take this massive amount of property, which you said was 1100 approximately. Mm-hmm. Uh, how will we decide which ones we're going to bid on? First of all, this past Tuesday, we had a webinar with the students that were attending the auction coming up less than a week away. I see. And I went over that with them on the webinar, and I said, try to figure out maybe what neighborhoods you're interested in, whether you want to do houses or you want to do houses and some vacant land, all of that kind of stuff. And so the assignment for this week is I wanted them to have at least 30 on their list that they would be interested in bidding on. I see. Okay. And then we'll get together and we'll drive by these properties in Saturday afternoon and Sunday afternoon and make some judgment calls on what we see in person. I see. Okay. That's good. So they get, they get, they go to class before they go to class. Yes. There's two webinars ahead of time, one hour each. And then on the Saturday and Sunday, we're going to take and have class from eight to noon, both days in class. And then we'll drive around in the afternoon. And if we have to, even into the evening and look at more properties. Okay. So this when so when you get to Oklahoma, this is formal. You all get together and you go to a little conference room or something and have a class to refresh everybody. Is that what you do? Yep. We have a small meeting room and uh-huh. it's just a very select group of people on the buying tour. This is very exclusive. I see. Okay. All right. So you have this uh, meeting and uh, do pre- people bring their computers and uh, access the properties or what do they do? Yep. They need to bring their computer or their tablet and okay. definitely a GPS to nego- negotiate the driving later in the day. Oh. And I mean, it's complete soup to nuts as far as how to learn how to do this. I see. All right. When you drive around, what does that mean? When you drive around, what what are you doing that for? We want to look at the properties in person. Oh, okay. So you're going to look at them. Okay. All right. Something's happened since the list came out. Did a prop, did a house burn to the ground or? Oh, Oh, that would be bad. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I have found those kind of houses on the list at other auctions. In fact, I got to one house several years ago and the house was gone but no. the basement was still there the basement was <laughs> the basement was still there they had not removed it or dug it out they just put plywood over the top to prevent people from getting hurt oh my goodness somebody come back and rebuild right over that house over that i got it okay <laughs> anyway uh, good so when they go out and look what are they looking for they're looking at the condition of the house There's pictures that can be accessed from the appraiser's website and from Google Earth and that kind of stuff. But some of those pictures are two years old. Some of them are five. Some of them are seven or eight years old. And you want to know where the, what the house looks like today. I see. You're buying it in two or three days at the auction. In my neighborhood, we had a tornado and everybody lost their roof except me because I had one of those metal roofs attached to my house and all the roofs were gone. It was amazing. I looked, I got up in the morning and we all looked and we all walked around the neighborhood and we could see in everybody's house, they, they had no roofs. So that could happen, couldn't it, just overnight? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. All right, so you go drive around and then do, do the students compete with each other? Or how, how, how does this work out? I have no control whether the, comp- the students bid against each other or not. Uh-huh. I know I don't bid on anything because right. I'm working. Some I've had I've been on other buying tours where the students bid against each other. I last year none of the students bid on the same property that another student did. Their choice. This is a pretty big auction. I would think there'd be plenty for everybody. I know even last year not all the properties had sold at the auction. Oh, they couldn't sell them all? Really? They couldn't sell them all. So I would say that there was probably upwards of about 100 properties that were struck off to the county of Tulsa. And people would not even believe that if we told them, would they? 100 properties left over. Oh, that's right. absolutely 
That's amazing. Now, what do they do with those properties? I believe they put them on a separate list. I don't believe that they're on this year's list. And okay. I believe you can buy them over the counter. How many years have you been taking people auctions? I think this is six years now. Oh, boy, you've been doing a long time. Have you ever had a student buy a property? Oh, absolutely. In fact, one of the students that's going to Tulsa with us, she bought a property last year and she didn't go to any other buying tours in between and she's going back to Tulsa this year. Wow, how about that? So she found a place she likes and she's gonna keep going back. Uh, that's a good idea actually, go back and uh, good for her. Well, that's great. What's the most you've ever seen someone buy? One person. Or even the class. Oh, okay, because I was going to say, for one person, it would be me. I was at an auction, and I bought 31 properties, and even the people working the auctions, like, nobody has ever bought as many properties as you bought today. Oh, there must be a story here. I better ask another question. <laughs> you bought 31 properties at one auction? Yes. That's impossible. No, it's not. That's where I purchased the 22 lots from Brandon Estates. So I only had to buy nine more. So, so you bought, what'd you do, buy a whole subdivision? Almost. I let some other people have some of them too. Oh, gee, I let some people have some. And were they just old tacky property? Were they houses? What were they? No, they were vacant lots in a brand new subdivision that was less than 10 years old with 13 beautiful brand new houses in there. And what was the price of the houses in there? Between one hundred and fifty and two hundred thousand dollars. Oh my goodness! So these lots had a lot of value. Oh, absolutely. And what did you pay? I paid between one hundred and eight hundred dollars each. I don't think that's fair. I I think it's fair, and and I need to find another one of those. Uh, oh my God! You paid a hundred dollars, and there was a hundred fifty thousand dollar house somewhere in the same neighborhood. Yes. Oh my goodness! Wow. Well, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. Okay, so you won the contest, no doubt. How about at, uh, at, did you ever have an auction where everybody got one? No, we've never had that yet. But yeah. one of the auctions we were at, everybody didn't get one. But between the students, I think they bought between six and eight properties. Between six and eight. That was a lot. So that little group had a good time. Yeah. Oh, they, yeah. Definitely. They, a, they were talking it up afterwards, huh? And what's the, what's the reaction when someone gets a property at auction? If they've done this before, they're pretty darn calm because they just expect to get them. I see. Um, if somebody's totally brand new, you'll see a jump in their step. And like when they go to pay for it, that really, kind of stuff. Really? Really? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So they're pretty happy. Mm-hmm. Uh, gee, you've done it just, this has really been a wonderful call. Thank you. I really appreciate you coming on. When will you go to another auction? Do you do, how often do you do this? It looks like we're going to do them about every other month. And the next one would be in Michigan in late August or early September. Oh boy. Okay, great. All right. I'm going to, I'm going to run out of time here, but are all the people that go on the auction tour your students or do you handle the other coaches' students too? Anybody who wants to go on the auction tour, it's available to them. I know some people have auctions already in their package, like the Diamond students. Oh, yeah. But for other people, I think on this one, I've got two of my students, and then the rest are other coaches' students. How nice is that? That's just really great. Boy, you've just done a wonderful job, and uh, you come across like uh, the old pro that you are. So I'm, I'm happy that you came on the call. And uh, do you have any parting words for my uh, podcast listeners? If you're at all interested in going on a buying tour, the next time one comes out, call Kim at the office or email Kim and register for the buying tour. It is a life-changing event that is not to be missed by anyone. Wow. Now, am I going to have to be a computer expert if I go to these auctions? Absolutely not. You can do it the way Ted Thomas learned it way, way back in the horse and buggy days. You can yep. just go and research and go to the county and look at everything and all that if you want to. Oh, yeah. Yep. That's great. Terrific job. Uh, I want to wish you a great weekend. We ran a little over, but I, it couldn't have been better information for our group. So thanks again for coming on. And for all you podcast listeners, uh, I hope you learned a lot today. Remember, imagine wealth without risk. And here's a guy that can help you get there. Thanks again, Bill. Thank you, Ted. It was an honor to be here.
Okay, welcome back, everyone. As I promised, I'm going to have Alex Mondosian with us here for the next uh, 30 minutes or so. So listen, open up your mind and get ready. And as I said earlier, he's a pretty famous guy. He's worked with Richard Branson. Wouldn't you like to work with Larry Larry King and famous people? He's done that. And of all you people that are authors and wish you were, well, Jack Canfield's kind of your god. And this guy has worked with even with Larry Canfield. I wish I'd worked with all these famous people, but I want to get right into the broadcast. And Alex is here. And Alex, I'd like you to t- tell people a little bit about yourself, if you would. And you can elaborate. And I know you're a humble guy, so don't be too humble because we got lots of time. And I want you to tell a little about yourself. There's reasons that you're successful and entrepreneurs are successful. And then there's reasons they're not successful. So why don't we start there and then we'll work our way into some of the other questions. Okay, Ted, thank you. And the, the three reasons why people fail, I'll start with that because that's what you want to move away from. And then I'll tell you a little bit about myself is number one, people don't get started. That's called procrastination. Number two, they don't finish. That's called perfectionism. Those are the twin enemies of success, a lack of success, procrastination and perfectionism. And then the third is the most insidious because most people get tired of their own stuff. They think they're promoting to a grandstand of people just sitting there, but they're really promoting to a walking parade. And uh, David Ogilvie said that, one of the great advertisers of all time. And that is because they don't keep it going. They don't keep it going like you have in the niche that you're in. You've been doing it a long time. And that's called building momentum. Without momentum, we would never have an iPhone. If Steve Jobs was depressed because the iPod sales reduced the sales of Apple over 33% its first year out, he, we would have never had the iPhone. So you got to maintain that momentum. Same with Facebook, same with any of the Richard Branson companies. So not getting started, not finishing, and not keeping it going. Those are the three reasons of failure. Now, I've experienced all three of those, and I'm guilty of all three of those. I'm the son of George and Carol Mondosian. I grew up in Pasadena, California, which is Southern California. My mother still doesn't know what I do. But I think <laughs> I believe that. I believe that. <laughs> yeah, what I tell my what I tell my students is there's not a single millionaire in my family. They everyone wanted me to get a job. Every one of my my grandparents on both sides, my mom, my sister, my dad, my brother in law, they're all teachers. But the oh. difference between them teaching students and me teaching other teachers, because everyone's a teacher, but I'm a teacher of teachers. I'm a trainer's trainer. And I think that's why I'm the only millionaire in the family. And not that money defines who you are, but man, it doesn't buy happiness, but it sure makes misery a lot easier to deal with, right? <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. So, yeah. so as it as it turns out, in, in 2001, I went out on my own. I was on Madison Avenue. I was making a great salary as a chief marketing director on a Madison Avenue company for about eight years in Manhattan. I lived in Manhattan. That's New York City. And then my son was born. Gabriel was born in the year 2000. We moved out uh, to Northern California, where I'm at now. And that year I made on my own as a direct marketer, not as a consultant, but having my own product to sell in digital marketing, I made $63,700. And I was panicked because that's like an 80% pay drop. And wow. If you have a family or if you're married, you know that you spend at the $300,000 level, not at the $63,000 level. So I was panicked. So then I set an intention and a challenge to turn my annual income into a monthly income. And one of my good friends, Bob Proctor, taught me that. He was in the movie, The Secret. He's the white haired guy. Everyone knows him by that. So he's he's in Toronto. And by 2003, my annual income became a monthly income. In 2004, it became a weekly income. By 2005, daily, not every day, but enough to be notable. I think I did it 16 times. And then there was a magic moment uh, about a year later where I made $1.2 million in less than 30 minutes. So I tell people, everyone in this room is going to make a million dollars. Every single one of you, I promise you, you will. Some of you will, it'll take 50 years. Some will take 40, some 30, some 10. That's 100,000 a year. The key is to stockpile that revenue so that you keep some of it and to do it in a year. If you're going to learn how to do it in a year, don't you want to learn it from someone who's done it in less than half an hour? And so that's my hook to get people interested. And it's bragging, 
But false humility is worse than arrogance, I think. So right. that's what I typically tell people. I got on the internet, uh, BG, I'm a, you've heard of BC. Yeah. BG is before Google is God with a little G, right? Yeah. So I got on the internet as a digital marketer in 1995, consulting, and I have an infomercial marketing experience, electronic marketing, anything with a battery or a plug, I'm good at, and as well as direct mail like you. Yeah. And now I focus on coaches, consultants, and any type of service professional, startup or otherwise, who hate to sell. That's my target audience. That's the target for my podcast of All Selling Aside. I figured, why don't I focus on the chief complaint that people have versus having these false premonitions that people are already good at selling. You teach trial closes, which I learned from, and I use all the time. I have them on stage on the table, just not remembering yeah, all of them. That's the way to do it. Just all... get them all over the place. That's the only way you use them. If they're yeah. not in front of you, they, they don't get used. That's right. Yeah. And, and yeah. so can you imagine what life will look like if you hated to sell, but you knew the formula of seeding through storytelling. Yeah. What if you knew this a year ago? What would your life look like today? Do yeah. you want to learn more about this? Those are trial closes right there. I've learned from you, Ted, and I'm, I'm so happy that you allowed me to come on board because most people hate to sell, yet they do it all the time. If you're married, you can sell. If you have a child, you can sell. If you have a dog and you feed it, you can sell. Uh, if you were a child, you can sell. You're a better salesman at five years old than you are right now, most likely. You, you probably tried to close more often with your parents or whoever. You are certainly you. persistent. That's right. Yeah, exactly. That was negative number one, persistence, right? Exactly. Yeah. So that's a little bit about me, but my mother still doesn't know what I do, and she doesn't she doesn't know why anyone would listen to me for more than five minutes, so I'm glad she's not listening right now. Yeah. You are a great storyteller. There's no doubt about it. Now, let me take you back to this time when you were, you were only making 63000 I have people that on the podcast that are just getting started, and then I have some old-timers like myself, and they're all trying to learn about tax liens and deeds. If you're going to be an entrepreneur, just go into some of the nitty-gritties of being that entrepreneur, because you and I met when you were, I think you were working with Susan Summers. Is that how far I was. back you go? Yeah, and she I had an infomercial at the time cool. called The Thigh Master, which everyone right. purchased, but they put in their closet. But it was yeah. the appeal. And yeah. she had a celebrity appeal. Her oh uh, husband yeah. was Alan Hamill, who right. was a, a spokesperson for a grocery store chain here in Southern California. And they made that thing work. Yeah. And I was the media, I was part of the media company that was buying television ads for Thigh Master back in the 90s. I know how much those television commercials cost, so I know you made a lot of money. Everybody that was in television made a lot of money, except the guys that advertised. Sometimes. Exactly. And that was me. But tell us about the, what were the traits of the, first of all, you must have got itchy feet or something. If you're making, a, let's say, a quarter million a year, and then all of a sudden you decide you're going to be an entrepreneur. That was a risky set, a risky time in your life, especially if you had a new wife and uh, new kids. So t tell us a little bit about that and what it takes. What's the mindset that goes on there. Now, I appreciate that they have to do a, a lot of things, but there were certain things that probably worked for you and there's certain things that didn't. And I don't think it's always the same for everybody, but I like to find out where the millionaires came from. Okay, I will tell you, nothing is as persuasive as a threat. And so my then wife, I'm divorced oh. now at the time of this recording, six years, but my then wife, Amy, who I'm very good friends with and is the mother of my two children, Gabriel and Brianna. She threatened to divorce me in the year 2000 after my son was born because we had no family, AKA professional babysitters in Manhattan. So I left because I was forced to leave. I really didn't want to leave. I, I loved her. I was in love with her at the time. And I left because I wanted to maintain that relationship and my family. So it was the threat of divorce. <laughs> Th she they got me to California leave for California. Yeah, oh, and, and I can give you a great story, but that's the truth. So I can give you wow. a good, a good reason, and then that's be, the real reason. Every right? once in a while, someone believes the truth. It's okay. It's it, exactly. Right. Sometimes <laughs> it takes two thousand years to believe in the truth, but this yeah. one—that's the one that uh, is the yeah. truth. So when we, it. when I came to um, Northern California, where my in-laws were, mm -hmm. um, we we secluded ourselves in Orinda, California, which I know oh. you know where it is. It's just yeah. on the other side of the Caldecott tunnel, which is 10 degrees warmer than the, the Oakland side, which is well, nice. I'm from and, Danville, so I sure know where Orinda is. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And so we, uh, I cut a deal with my in-laws. Let me stay there for six months for free until we find uh, some housing. And they allowed us. We were there eight months. And my, my then father-in-law never ha has me forget that. <laughs> at least we weren't there a year, <laughs> man. Anyway, so oh, we were there and I thought, hey, the uh, bubble just burst. The dot-com bubble 
burst. Oh, oh. I sent out resume after resume because everyone wants me to have a job yeah. and no one would hire me. Plus, when I had an interview, I would offend the person who was hiring me because I, I felt I was smarter than they were. So I'm not hireable. Oh boy. Now, if you're listening and you feel you're not hireable, that's a good thing and that's a bad thing. It's a bad thing because it's terrifying if you don't have an income. It's a good thing because you can be your own boss. Yep. So Boone and Bain is the same thing. So I decided to launch something that didn't exist. It was a course. It was a physical product, which people at the time were not selling. They were selling $20 eBooks. And I sold it for 10 times more. I sold it for $247. And it was called Marketing with Postcards. And I thought, digital marketers are only doing email. And this is the time of AOL. If you remember America Online, yes, people were yes. getting CDs with 1,400 free hours and all that kind of stuff. If you remember going that far back, this is yeah. the year 2000, 2001. Yeah. And so I thought, what is a postcard but a billboard or a web page by mail? It's nice. naked. There's no envelope. Copywriters are paid tens of thousands of dollars just getting the envelope open. What if the envelope was already open and everyone saw it? So I went after business to business service professionals, teaching them how to market their business with postcards, but I did it through the internet. So that was my first product. And what's really annoying is I go all, of, all over the world and I tell students, I want you to be bigger than me, wealthier than me, have more marketing reach than me. And nothing is, an, is more annoying than when it actually happens. Ryan Dice was one of my students for that uh, program. Oh, and he now runs Digital Marketer, the most successful digital marketing company in the world. Perry Belcher, his partner, same thing. And so I cut my teeth with that course. And then I started to, I was good at curriculum design and I was good at teaching and I entertain at the same time, because I think you need to entertain and teach. And so that's the way I began. And I think the single most important thing is I focused on the passion versus the profit. I would sacrifice short-term profit for long-term wealth. And most people, if they go after the profit, you can smell someone who's trying to close or slam you, as they say in sales, into something that you don't really need yet or you don't have the level of intimacy to, to, to say yes. So that was the one thing where I felt I did really well. I, I would sacrifice short-term profit for long-term wealth, which means I would focus on relationship capital versus creating the money capital. Because relationship capital, the nice thing about that is it's an ongoing and never-ending appreciating asset. But if I give you a dollar, Ted, and you keep the dollar, I've lost it and you own it. But if I give you a lead or if I give you a strategic alliance partner candidate, then I still know that person and so do you. So one and one makes three synergistically. That's what I focused on. And most people aren't willing to do that in the beginning because they're chasing the money and you, you sell through return on investment. And so what people get from that is not the relationships I'm gonna grow, they look at the money I'm gonna make. And right. in the first year, that's a mistake because when you focus on that, then you won't be able to grow the relationships because they will see what your focus is on, and it's not on them. It's mm -hmm. on Amazing. the money. I know it's a little woo, but yeah. that I think is the is really the secret to my success. When people say, what's the secret to your success? The other answer I give is, I'm more willing to look bad in public than you are. Yeah. And yeah. I don't look at it as rejection. I look at it as, huh, that's another objection. I'll put that in my objection notebook, and I'll anticipate it next time. Look, Madison Avenue is pretty uh, sophisticated, and now you've gone to California. You're on your own. Now you're completely on your own. What's the difference between getting that client and the client that you had in New York in that very sophisticated environment? The, the difference is I have to do it all. I don't exactly. have the bookkeeper. I don't have the sales team. I don't have the operations manager. I have to do it all. I have to get the doing business as name. I have to make sure my taxes are in check. And so what I did, which is different than what other people do, most people hire a personal assistant. That's the first hire they have. And then after that, they hire a salesperson. That's not what I did. And I recommend, as you're listening right now, you may not 
believe a thing I say, and I don't want you to. I want you to believe it only if you experience it, but try this. Your first hire, if you're not in business right now, make it your bookkeeper. Make it really? so that you are uncomfortable not having that bookkeeper being busy because you are the first marketer and salesperson for your company. You can't hire that out. It's like giving a newborn baby to an orphanage. You can't give, you can't outsource sales and marketing. That's ridiculous. No one cares about your company as much as you do. So in the beginning, you do everything, but hire a bookkeeper. And when they're twiddling their thumbs, when they got nothing to do, guess what? You're not doing your job. And so that way, that pain of having to pay someone monthly, which I did, until I, I started hurting them, man. I, I, I started hurting them where they had so much stuff to do. They, they asked me for a raise. I thought, now I've arrived. So your first hire should be the bookkeeper, not a personal assistant to do the emails and the busy work and all the other stuff that you think you should do. You do everything but the bookkeeping, which you probably don't like to do unless you're methodical. Oh. And I think that's the best <laughs> advice I can give everyone. You won't take it. Okay, you won't take the challenge. I know because I've, I've said this for 20 years. But if you do, it'll change your life. Okay, so now here's another one that's a tough one. Okay, so you said it uh, just a few minutes ago. You had to do everything. Okay, you know, all right. So it would seem to me that you're naturally inclined to talk with people or you're practiced enough so you can really be good talking with them. So you can get along with people. You're a, a flexible person. But what are all these different things that an entrepreneur has to do? See, people come on to my podcast and they say, oh, gee, Ted, you make it sound so easy, but there's tax liens, there's tax deeds, there's this, there's that. How am I going to learn all this? And then what about selling? And I want, just, I want to spend at least a, the last few minutes of this talking about selling. People don't understand that entrepreneurs do a lot. So talk about entrepreneurs doing a lot. And you started from, it wasn't scratch, $60,000 a year for a lot of people is a lot of money, but it, it's, only, it's only a little bit if you're making two, a quarter million. So, but the point is, what are all these things that entrepreneurs, they're almost saddled with a lot of things that first year, aren't they? It, it's a, look, it's a choice. No one is making you, and I'm talking to you, the listener. Right. If you're still listening, you're here for a reason. It's no accident you're still listening. So there's something I'm saying or Ted's saying that is this worthwhile. It's no one is making you be an entrepreneur. That is up to you. Now, I look at as an employee, and I'm not going to get political, but this is the best analogy I can think of. I look at it as being an employee as socialism, right? E equality of outcome. So if you are a CPA or if you are an assistant, executive assistant, if you're a sales manager, you're going to have the equality of outcome of the pay that person gets. That's not what an entrepreneur is. An entrepreneur is a capitalist. And in, in capitalism, again, this is not political. It's equality of opportunity. Now, what does that mean? That means that you have the opportunity to break through that glass ceiling of having a job. But in the beginning, you're going to make less money. Even if you make a million dollars a year, you may be paying yourself less if you're growing. It's crazy. Now, why would you want to do that? Well, there's only one reason. There's only one word I can think of. There's only one value, and that is freedom. Freedom. If you honor freedom the way I do, you are willing to crawl through the 500 yards of the Shawshank Redemption Tunnel, if you've ever seen that movie, oh. through the sewage mm -hmm. to get to the other side. Yuck. Yuck. And it's raining and stormy outside, but you are free because you've been imprisoned for an unjust cause as the main character in that movie was. So the bottom line is you have to do it all. And the reason you have to, it's a must, is because how are you going to teach something if you haven't experienced it? You're going to just trust that someone's going to come on board and do what's right? No, you have to do it so that you can teach it and transfer that knowledge to the next person who's going to support you. So it's an honor to work 16 hours a day in the beginning because it's only doing that that makes it possible for you to take three days off a week like I've done sometimes. It's like childbirth, right? For 40 weeks, it, it's not, you're, you're giving birth. Your father released you, your mother received you. And after 40 weeks, you come out, hopefully head first, and you're like 10,000 times bigger than when you started and you were born a winner because you won the ovarian lottery. And then when you come out- you, you, I don't you, believe you said that, but you did. Okay. It's true. Think about it. We're born oh, winners, okay. Ted. 
But we oh, only yes. learn how to you're, lose. You've got the most positive attitude of anybody I know. Now, I have to interrupt you. i got to stop you, okay? Go ahead. I've only got eight minutes left, okay? And these are the most important eight minutes, okay? Uh, and the reason they're most important eight minutes is here's what I tell my clients, and they won't believe me, but you believe me. I know that, all right? So here's the deal. People want to buy these tax defaulted properties and they get them for pennies and they sometimes fix them up and then they sometimes, but what they ultimately want to do is they want to sell them. So I tell everyone that the most difficult thing you're going to do in all of this business is you're going to have to get in your brain that you have to sell stuff. People just shake in their boots when I say sell stuff. So I don't know anybody I could turn to other than you that could answer the question, What's it like to sell things? Why is it important to sell things? How do they go about selling things and not really be a salesman? Because they think that's, they think a car salesman isn't good. They think a guy that's knocking on the door and selling isn't good. Those are all people trying to earn a living just like you and I do. But I've got to give them some relief. They need some relief, but they don't, they believe that I'm telling them the truth, but they don't believe that they can do it. So yeah. how do people go about selling? And give me well, a few minutes about that. My podcast, which is on iTunes, All Selling Aside, the whole focus is on the ideal listener for someone who hates to sell. They hate well, selling. Before you go further, give them that address on that and then give me some real things to bite into sure. to take home. Yeah, to all, se- all selling aside.com. It's very simple. It's free. It's 25 years of my experience in 25 minutes each week. All selling aside.com. I believe in selling, but the way I teach it to students is through seeding, seeding. Seeding through storytelling is the new selling. That's our tagline. Why? Okay, because you've heard of root cause, Ted. Root cause is inaccurate. It's really seed cause because the seed flops into a root, which turns into a trunk, then branches, then leaves, then fruit. And inside the fruit, if it's an apple tree, there's more seeds. So there's this ecosystem that you want to create. So seeding through storytelling means, number one, you want to identify all of the locked doors or objections that you're anticipating that you're going to get, such as it's not the right time, or I got to talk to my spouse, or uh, it's too much money. It's not in my budget. You can just list them one by one, and you know you're going to get them. Now, if you anticipate and have a response through a story, Not through a debate, because debates you will lose, but through a story. And I'll give you an example. Within the eight minutes, it's very good. And what will happen is you will unlock each door. Now, let's say there are five to nine doors that are blocking you between point A, where you are now, and point B, where you want to be. That's why they call it point B, the sale. Now, people typically think it's seven plus or minus two. You can look it up on Google, right? It's the law. So but let's say there's five to nine objections that you typically get. Why not anticipate what they are by having five to nine vignettes or stories to unlock the doors before they even come up? Now, people think that one key unlocks every door. That's not true. Uh. You have to have five to nine different keys to open the lock to each door. Because once you open one door, you got another one. And then another one. So if you can anticipate objections, then you will embrace an objection because the sale doesn't begin, Ted, until you get the first objection. Exactly. Because the objection is interest and engagement. But yet most people think when they get an objection, they failed. Why don't you reframe that as that's not the end of the world. It's the beginning of a new era. You've just started the sales process. So There's about five to nine, as I said. So I'll give you an example. So I go on stage a lot. And you know that. You've seen me on stage. And you're you're the best on stage seller I've ever seen. I've learned a lot from you. And you have trial closes. Thank you. I have stories. So when I go on stage, one of the toughest things is to get someone off their butt and run to the table in the back of the room to buy your product. That's the toughest thing in the world to do. And it can be humiliating, embarrassing. And believe me, I've felt all of the spectrums of of feelings when it comes to failing and succeeding. So I need to get them to take action. So what do I do? I don't debate with them. I don't shame them as a lot of speakers do. I tell a story. So here's the story. You know, in December of 2000 and just fill in the blank, I was in Australia and that happens to be summer there. I was there with my partner, Sandra, whom you know, Ted, 
Yes. And who just got a $2,500 check for a tax lien, by the way. So thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. And, and I was there and we decided on Christmas morning, we're going to see the sunrise because the sun rises from the ocean there on the Gold Coast of Australia. And so it rises at 4.03 a.m. So I set my alarm to 3.45 a.m. Now that's early. So I want to see the sunrise. I want to hold my partner's hand and just see that beautiful moment. And what a great feeling to have and share with a partner watching the sunrise from the ocean. Because I see it set here in California, but I like to see it rise from the ocean. So when my alarm went off for my iPhone at 3.45 a.m., I had a decision to make. Shall I click on the snooze button, as many people do? Yeah. Or shall I click on the stop button, which means I'm making a decision and I'm going to get up and walk with my partner outside and get dressed and brush my teeth, et cetera. Now, who are snoozers? Who clicks snooze? I have them raise their hand. Great. How's that work for you? You're going to torture yourself and suffer for another eight minutes until your alarm rings again. Why do you do that? Why did you make the decision in the first place? If you're a snoozer, please do not get off your chair two days from now and buy my continuing education because this course is not for you. It's not for snoozers. It's for people who want to stop what they're doing Beautiful. and Beautiful. stop the suffering Beautiful. and move forward. Okay. Beautiful. So, so I got up, I watched the sunset. I'll be a little vulnerable. It's true. We wept together because men don't cry. We weep. Right. Yeah. And, it was such a beautiful moment, and I would have missed that if I clicked the snooze button and not take advantage of the opportunity that was before me on Christmas Day in Gold Coast, Australia. Oh, on Christmas Day you did that. On, wow. on Christmas Day. It's summer there. Oh, yeah. my goodness. Yeah. Oh. So th that's my story for snoozers. Oh, I love so, that. I so love now. Me, I, tell me another one. Run over on time. It's okay. Okay. Yeah. So here, another, here's another one. Oh, I love it. I love it. Here's another one. All right. So the, the other one is transparency. Uh -huh. So it was October 26th, the year 2000. There I am in Mount Sinai Hospital in New York City. And I am terrified. I'm looking at my newborn son. He's one day old. And my then wife sleeping exhausted after 17 hours of labor. I was exhausted oh, wa watching. 17 hours. Yeah, I was exhausting watching. Oh. And he came into the world three weeks early because my wife's OBGYN was going on vacation. And she wanted him to deliver our child. So he induced pregnancy and he came out healthy. Okay. Now, oh. I had a problem because I had a teleseminar that evening, and it was with a bunch of CPAs and bookkeepers, and I had a $500 course I was going to sell, $497. And I looked at this old-style phone with a bunch of push buttons, and I looked at the chair, which was my bed. That's poetic justice for men because they don't give birth. Yeah. The, cha the chair was my bed or the phone, the bed, the phone, the bed, the phone. I took oh. the phone, and I pulled the long cord underneath the only private room in the recovery room, which was the restroom. And I oh put it my on my lap. God. Yeah. In the first time in human history, I put down the toilet seat and the lid. And I sat there and I gave my teleseminar for an hour. Now, something terrible happened. I didn't notice it, but there was this giant speaker with a woofer in the bathroom. And at 50 minutes after the hour, because it was 8.50 p.m. East Coast time, visiting hours will end in 10 minutes in the worst New York accent you could think of. And everyone heard it. So I tried to suffocate that background noise, but ev I think everyone heard it. And I said, oh, shit, shoot. Yeah. What am I going to do? And then five minutes later, another one. There's a two-minute warning for visiting hours at Mount Sinai Hospital. And then finally, when we were finished, I said, folks, I got to come clean. My son was born yesterday. He came in three weeks early. I didn't anticipate this. And what you heard was the receptionist saying visiting hours are over. I don't have any visitors but I have over 500 people listening right now. And wow. I just have to apologize on my behalf because I didn't know this would happen. I'm in the bathroom. I'm sitting on the toilet in the recovery room. So please forgive me. And I hope our paths cross often. And I hung up. So I thought, okay, I'm not going to make any money. And at least I was true and truthful with them. I was transparent. Next day, I go home with my new family and I pop open my email and I set it up. So every time I got an order, it would go ka-ching. So I opened it up and go ka-ching. No. Go, what the heck is this? And I almost made $13,000 from that teleseminar in the year 2000. My family's sleeping. I knew I could use the money. And I thought, wow, if I can make $13,000 from sitting on the toilet lid of Mount Sinai Hospital in the recovery room, can't you do 10% of that doing teleseminars? And that's the origin story of doing whatever it takes to sell through virtual presentation. Wow. Wow. All right. So what I got from all that was, is 
these people are, uh, will have a lot less trouble selling if they can anticipate what the question is going to be or what you and I would call the objections are going to be. Is correct. That correct. Okay. That's correct. And okay. uh -huh. it doesn't even have to be your story. You can go to online and look at an Aesop story and look at the uh, stories that Aesop told or fables. It doesn't matter. Okay. But if you tell a story, people don't question the story because the story is right. planting the seed to the sale. And once the seed takes root, then you end up going to heaven without the inconvenience of dying because it takes a lot more seeds yeah. that you need to plant in order to get one root to grow. The redwood tree, which I have tons here in, in Northern California, I mean, they have over eight million seeds they drop each year, but only a few take root. Just anticipate you will get objections, that's get excited, that'll be the beginning of the sale. And then make sure you plant the seeds, which are your stories, and you will entertain them and earn money at the same time. The beauty of what you said was you maintain a non-adversarial position, no matter how bad your feelings were hurt, that you didn't get the sale or how difficult it was, you now roll into a story that keeps you engaged and keeps you engaged with the client. If you can maintain engagement, you have another chance. And you didn't say it that way, but you did say it by saying, look, you're carrying the thing forward with, with the story. It's a, it was a beautiful way to sell. Absolutely. Thank you. Je Jeffrey yeah. Gittimer, I think, whom he's a colleague yes. of mine, he says people hate to be sold, but they love to buy. Yeah. And, yeah. and so- Did he write all those little red books? Wasn't that what he wrote? Oh yeah, he did. Yeah. And, 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 and that's what I would recommend is don't sell. Sale trainers hate to hear that. Don't sell. Tell stories to seed exactly. a buying environment. And the buying environment is taking root so that this tree of prosperity can grow for you. I don't mean to be non-concrete, but I tried to be as concrete as, as possible through s uh, specific stories. And all you got to do is come up with the objections and the stories, and then you're 80% there. You got to know what you're offering, and you got to make that sound beneficial. But if you overcome objections through storytelling and seating, then 80% of the sale is done automatically. Oh, that's terrific. Now, folks, you've heard the great Alex Mondosia, and then he's going to give you his uh, address so you can know a little bit more about him and, and do some research on him. But now you know why he's worked with all the greats like the Tony Robbins of the world and the Larry Kings that I mentioned, Susie Orman, and all the big ones. He's been there, worked on the same platform with him, and you can see why. I'm honored that you're my guest and happy to have you, Alex, and I'm going to look forward to having you back very soon. But don't leave without very slowly saying at least two times where people could contact you. I'm going to make a declaration. Listen to me work with Ted. Listen to me and work with Ted. Go to allsellingaside.com, and there's no opt-in required, meaning you don't even need your email address. You can listen to all the episodes for free. They're 25 minutes, and it's 25 years of heartache, mistakes, and revenue-generating experience put into 25 minutes week after week as a public service. It's my legacy. It's better than writing a book. Once again, allsellingaside.com. You can listen to me and read the notes, but work with Ted. Alex, you are absolutely terrific. Wonderful job. I'm so glad that you are here. I'm looking forward to seeing you very soon. And I have to sign off for now because we ran out of time. So long.